welcome everybody to the All Fellow series for the Australia India Institute, India Week. And my name is Prof Charles Green. I'm Professor of Contemporary Art in Art History at the University of Melbourne. I've got a long term interest in uh, Indian modern and contemporary art. And so for me, it's a great privilege to host and chair today's seminar. But first of all, I want to acknowledge the First Nations people upon whose land we sit and stand. In my case, it's the Jajawurung people of central and northern Victoria. For each of you, it's um, another group, another set of First Nations people, but we acknowledge that the ground upon which we sit is land that was never ceded, and we pay our respects to elders past and present. So I'm introducing Michael Moignard, who has a long and distinguished history as a, as a diplomat for Australia, for a substantial part of his career based in Delhi at the High Commission, where I think I missed him by about a month back in 1998. I was there in Delhi for about six months then. Um, Michael, Michael's been working, has submitted a PhD on collecting, Australian collecting. And this alone is of enormous interest uh, because very, very few people have researched the collecting that was done in Australia in the 1930s and 40s. So Michael is really now the, the expert on this, but it really adds to an emerging hot area in art history, which is histories of exhibitions and histories of collecting. And the two are deeply intertwined. And there's been very, very little work done extending those exhibition histories backwards from the start of the contemporary period to the modern period, uh, the fraught complex modern period, which Michael has, has been working on. And it's even more exciting for me that the focus of today's paper is Lady May Casey. In the abstract, she's Baroness, uh, but at the time it was, correct me, and Michael, feel free to correct me later, she was Lady Casey, the uh, wife and partner of Sir Richard Casey, who was the governor of Bengal. And that is incredibly interesting for scholars of modern and contemporary Asian art. For a start, because I simply was not aware in any way of her involvement with Indian art. I was intensely aware of her involvement with American art. She in fact was the first Australian at all to be a member of the International Council of the Museum of Modern Art. And she was a key link between the Museum of Modern Art and its touring exhibitions and Australia in the 40s, 50s, into the early 60s. But for her to be in Bengal at that precise point in time that Michael's going to explain to us, a time, the time of the great Bengal famine, the time when Indian modernist artists in Bengal and across India were so concerned by what was happening during World War II with the famine, that, that makes this a very exciting paper for me. So can we wordless, wordlessly and silently welcome Michael by clapping our hands as I very sincerely do. Welcome Michael, it's a great, great privilege to be here with you. Well, thank you very much, Charles, for that uh, great introduction. <laughs> I really do appreciate it. and. Um, uh, so, Simone, I'd like to share the screen. Ah. There we go. Okay, thank you very much, Charles. Uh, I'd like uh, also to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands where Melbourne University and La Trobe University campuses are. And I acknowledge the Wurundjeri and Boonarung peoples of the Kulin Nation and pay my respects to their elders past 
present and emerging. I recognise that Indigenous Australians have an ongoing connection to the land and these universities value their unique contribution both to the universities and to the wider Australian society. I'd also like to thank the Australian India Institute for giving me this opportunity to speak about current research I'm undertaking on May Casey's role as a supporter, patron and collector of modern art in the 1930s. This talk is based on a chapter from my PhD thesis undertaken at La Trobe University, which was submitted in June this year. I'd like to thank Dr. Carolyn Jordan and Dr. Timothy Jones for their support and guidance. I'd also like to acknowledge Professor Carmen McLean for her previous work on the May Casey papers in the National Library of Australia. May Casey arrived in Calcutta in January 1944 as a spouse of the newly appointed governor of Bengal, Richard Casey. The diplomatic position was one she was used to. Since 1940, she had been with Richard in Washington and then in Cairo. May introduced herself into Bengal society quickly, taking the opportunity to find new friends and experiences as he had done in the other countries she had lived in. But India was special to her. Her comments on her time there in her autobiography, Tides and Eddies, gives expression to her fascination with India and Bengal in particular. In this talk, I will discuss May's interaction with Indian art. She came to India with little knowledge of the art of India, but with a strong background in contemporary art. She became involved in the contemporary art of India very quickly and met and fostered the work of Indian artists such as Jamini Roy and others. She remained interested in India on her return to Australia in 1946, showing the work of Roy for the first time to Australian audiences. Her involvement in a major international sculptural prize led to a connection with Mulk Raj Anand and the publication of an essay on Australian contemporary art for an Indian audience. So May Casey was a tastemaker, an artist, an art collector, an aviator, an author, and an historian. Her life was one of glittering surfaces, as her biographer has noted. She was a remarkable woman who represented her country as the partner of Richard, later Baron Casey, a diplomat, member of parliament, governor of Bengal, and finally Australian governor general. Casey used her status in the worlds of diplomacy and politics to promote visual art and Australian artists. Her support for Australian art overseas, especially in Washington, when Richard was the Australian legate to the United States from 1940 to 1942, has been studied, but her other roles in the visual arts tend to be overlooked. She collected contemporary Australian art in the 1930s and 40s and used her collection to support Australian artists, generously lending to major exhibitions and donating some major Australian works to public collections. She deserves to be better known as a collector and patron in the development of modern art in Australia. But in this paper, I focus on a small but significant part of her her association with India. Casey was born to Charles and Alice Ryan in Melbourne in 1891 and named Ethel Marion Summer Ryan, but was called May by her family. The history of the Ryans could be traced back to the early days of the colony of Victoria. Her father was a surgeon and had his surgery and home in Collins Street. The family was financially secure and Casey went to boarding school in England when she was 16 in 1907. This was followed by an extensive visit to continental Europe. From then on, she spent more time in Europe and England than she did in Melbourne. Her collecting career probably began during this time. She married Richard Casey, a family friend in 1926. He was working in the British Foreign Office as a liaison officer between the Australian and British governments. Richard was a graduate in engineering from Melbourne University and Cambridge. He had served with distinction in the First World War and was at home in both England and Australia. 
They lived in London until 1931 when they returned to Australia. Their two children, Jane and Don, were born in 1928 and 1931, respectively. Richard began his political career at this time, and over the next 40 years, the Caseys were hardly out of the political and social spotlight driven by Richard's career. It took them to Canberra as a government minister, to Washington, Cairo, and Calcutta as a diplomat, Canberra again as a, a minister again in government, and finally as Governor General of Australia. May Casey strongly supported her husband's career and was closely involved in his work as a minister and diplomat. However, she created opportunities for her own interests during this life and was successful in her own right. While the couple's interests were not always contiguous, they did have one interest in common, their love of flying. Both were registered aviators and they purchased their first light aircraft in 1938. Casey was also an historian and a poet. Her first book on the early architecture of Melbourne was published in 1951 and went through several editions. A History of Her Family, an Australian Story, 1837 to 1907, was published in 1962. This was followed by her autobiography, Tides and Eddies, in 1966, which included details of her life as a government minister's wife and diplomatic spouse. Her final books were reminiscences of people she had met, including Nellie Melba and Edwina Mountbatten. Casey's artistic endeavours commenced after the First World War. On a return visit to Melbourne in 1920, she shared an artist studio with Joan Weigel, who later married Daryl Lindsay. Casey was a competent, if not a professional artist. She studied life drawing in Paris in 1910, went to lectures at the Louvre and attended classes at the Westminster School of Art in London. She was not to have formal art classes until she studied at the George Bell Arnold Shaw Art School in Melbourne from 1933 to 1938, when she was in her forties. Casey's style was influenced by Bell's teaching. Her work under Bell, such as this portrait of her two children, Jane and Don, was painted in 1934. And the, the paintwork is flat, soft in tone, and painted in a post-impressionist style. Bell said of her that she could have become a very good artist had she continued her training. She also had a strong interest in modern art and collected both modern, international and Australian art. In the mid 1930s, she was an advocate for modern art and was well known for introducing the first oil painting by Picasso to Australia, Le Repos, from 1932. It was bought in 1937 and it exhibited at the National Gallery of Victoria later that year. During her art studies at the Bell School, she met Russell Drysdale and Peter Purvis Smith. She collected their work and assisted them to gain an audience in the USA. She showed an interest in modern works during her postings in Washington and Cairo. And so it would be expected that she would be interested in the modern art of India. The role of the Kalkata in January 1944 came as Bengal was in crisis. The famine of 1942 to 1944 was coming to an end but deaths and sicknesses still prevailed. For Richard, he had to deal with political issues and the rising independence movement. He was forced to invoke a section 93 order to allow for the government to rule the province in March, 1945. This was an administrative order much used by governors to take over the governments of unruly provinces. He ruled Bengal for the rest of his time as governor. As he gained an understanding of the internecine political situation, he became more confident in his rule and left in March 1946 with praise in his ears, to be quoted. During his term, he had many conversations with India's nationalist leaders, including Gandhi, Nehru and Jinnah, looking for common ground. May often met with these leaders as well. Mark, remarking in Tides and Eddies, 
that she found Gandhi's strong, gentle personality irresistible. So neither Richard or May had any understanding of India or Bengal before coming there. But May was soon to learn of the Bengali people's sense of expression in the arts. From dance, music and poetry to textiles and painting. Their arrival in India in 1944 coincided with a significant time for contemporary Indian art. As India pressed for independence, its art was connecting to a future post-colonial world. Kolkata was the center for modernism in India, a modernism which was central to a reassessment of Indian art on its own terms, not those of the West, i.e. of the British colonialists. A major exhibition of the Bauhaus had been brought to Kolkata in 1922, and which included works by Kandinsky, Clay and other European modernists. This was the first time works of these artists had been shown in India and was a catalyst to move Indian art away from naturalism. An initial interest with cubism in the second decade of the 20th century gave way to a more German-based modernism involving expressionism and the new objectivity. Beginning in the 1920s, the Bengal modernists turned away from urban traditional subjects to that of rural India. The art of Rabindranath Tagore, Amrita Shergill and Jamini Roy was based on an interest in non-Western art. This echoed the role of non-Western art from Africa used by Picasso, Matisse and Kirchner to, explain, to expand their cosmopolitan approach to European art. By 1942, with nationalist ideas gaining momentum, the Calcutta group of artists was formed to cultivate modern Indian art in a secular vein, focusing on social art. The anti-colonial attitude to Western representation was beginning to gather pace. Casey showed an interest in each of these three major artists. She was drawn to the subject matter of Amrita Shergill, who painted Indian village life. Shev Gill has been described as the emancipated woman whose work takes precedence over everything else, a professional woman in a world of men. Casey would have empathized with Shev Gill and would have seen some of her own life in that of the Indian artist. And it was a pity that she never met Shev Gill who died in 1941. But she wrote perceptively about Shergill's art. To quote Casey, she saw her country with a new vision and has left a legacy of pictures, simple and grand, glowing in color like those of Gauguin as a tribute to the Indian countryside and its people. Another artist who used tribal and Caligat art for inspiration was Jamini Roy who lived and worked in Calcutta. Cecil Beaton, the uh, well-known uh, Indian uh, New UK photographer, who later met him when he was in Calcutta and described him in his book, Indian Diary, in his own inimitable style. To quote Beaton, off a side street in his studio sits Jamini Roy. He looks like a long baked potato nestling in a napkin in his immaculate white muslin. Roy was a modern artist whose style was motivated by Caligat painting, a homegrown folk art tradition in Calcutta. His very distinctive style was developed in the mid 1930s. His art has been described as marked by the simplicity of forms, the innocence in the almond eyes the fantasy of unanticipated colours creating a startlingly different imagery. Casey organised tours to his studio for visiting dignitaries, expanding the knowledge of his work beyond Bengal. Casey owned several of his works 
some of which were exhibited in London in 1945. She owned at least seven works by Roy, including a gauche of a weeping cow, which is illustrated here, given to her by Roy on her departure from Kolkata. The cow has continued to be owned by family members. She also owned a painting of Christ and his disciples. Roy painted Christian images, even though he was a Hindu. Asked by May why he painted these images, he replied that he painted subjects remote from his own life to show that the human and the divine could be combined only through symbols. Her support for Domeni Roy continued upon her return to Australia. One of her first projects was to organize an exhibition of some of her art collection, which was shown at the National Gallery of Victoria and the National Art Gallery of New South Wales in 1946 and 47. She included five works by Roy, the most by any one artist. Three were described in the catalogue as Gopini, or a female devotee of Lord Krishna. Others were described as a drawing of a woman and blue boy. These paintings would have been the first work, works by Roy to have been publicly exhibited in Australia. As well as these works, she also exhibited a work by Paratosh Sen, an artist of the Calcutta group that we've just mentioned, and she included an old Caligate print. None of these works can be positively identified now. In the few reviews of the exhibition of the, in the Australian press, unfortunately, none of the Indian paintings were mentioned. And in addition to these works, Casey's collections included a work by R. N. Chakravarti, an early member of the Bengal school in the 1920s, and a work by Prabha, a more recent Kolkata artist who worked in a distinctive Bengali style. Casey donated four of her Jamini Roy works to the National Gallery of Victoria in 1981. There were three paintings of women, both dancing and sitting, and a man with a parrot. The third artist that May was drawn to was Rabindranath Tagore. Even though he had passed away in 1941, she was able to organize an exhibition of his late paintings in 1945. She described them as mysterious and symbolic. Their brilliant color was organized and mastered by a vigorous, almost savage use of black. Tagore wrote that in relation to his pictures, it is for them to express, not to explain. In the West, Tagore's reputation was based on his poetry and prose. He took up painting in the 1930s in an expressionist style, and he was influenced by the non-Western art of the American West Coast Indians and by oceanic art, but not by tribal Indian art, which was the focus of Shergill and Roy. His work was a protest to the naturalism of colonial art. By showing these works at Government House and supporting artists like Roy, Casey was inadvertently, perhaps, providing support to the nationalist independence movement. While we don't know what works of Gore Casey chose to present, they are likely to have been of these types that are shown here, dark, moody, and expressionist. In addition to modernism, Casey became interested in the broader sweep of Indian art. And her first exhibition she held at Government House in 1945 focused on Bengal tribal and folk art, textiles and some modern works, but also included ancient works of Indian art, including bronzes and stone sculpture. These were provided by the Ashtosh Museum from Calcutta University. Jamini Roy assisted May to mount the exhibition. It was the first time an exhibition of this type had been shown at Government House, and there was quite a bit of concern about security. However, it was a success. It was a precursor of a major exhibition at Burlington House in 1947 of Indian art, organized by the newly formed Government of India, 
and the Royal Academy. This resulted in the publication of a book on Indian art and several mentions in the English press. While the exhibition included modern artworks, the main area of interest in the press was the ancient sculptures. The success of May's exhibition reached Australia and May was received requests from the National Gallery of Victoria and the National Art Gallery of New South Wales to organise such an exhibition in Australia. This didn't happen, but in 1952, the All India Fine Arts and Craft Society under the auspices of the Indian High Commission in Canberra did organise an exhibition of Indian art which toured Australian capitals. The exhibition consisted of photographs of Indian architecture and sculpture and some examples of Indian modern art, including works by Roy and Sher Gill. The exhibition was opened in Melbourne by Richard Casey. It provided yet another opportunity for Australian audiences to see the work of modern Indian artists. In June 1945, Casey organized an exhibition of Cecil Beaton's India photographs. He had been asked to visit the Middle East, India and China as part of a United Kingdom Ministry of Information campaign. He met the Caseys when he was in the Middle East in 1942, and he arrived in Calcutta in 1944 at around the same time as the Caseys and stayed at Government House whenever he was in Calcutta. Beaton did not photograph the war itself, but the people and exotica of both India and China. As portraiture was his stock in trade, he took many portraits of ordinary people as well as officials. He took many shots of the cases at Government House, which were close to glamour shots. The photographs of May were exquisite and were used for newspaper and magazine articles in the United Kingdom. On his return to London, an exhibition of his Indian photographs was held in Paris and he published a selection of his Indian photographs in 1945. May's exhibition included a selection of photographs from all over India, but she noted that with some parochialism, I was pleased to observe that the photographs he took of the Bengal face were the most interesting and moving of all. Looking back, it is amazing to see what May was able to do in her time in Calcutta. To have organized three exhibitions at Government House in 15 months was an extraordinary achievement. But May also painted while she was in India, in India particularly on her visits outside the capital. Her role as a governor's spouse took her to many villages in Bengal, usually by air. She also spent time in Darjeeling, where there was a government summer residence. She had at least one watercolour drawing published in the English language newspaper, Amrita Bazaar Patrika. The subject is of women from Darjeeling, painted in 1944. I'm not sure when it was published, but it's likely to have been. May was clearly very pleased with her Indian drawings, so much so that at least two of her works were illustrated in Tide and Eddies, another drawing of Darjeeling women and a watercolour of the Le Bon race course in Darjeeling. A painting of Government House in Darjeeling illustrated in the book also could be by Casey. Casey also had an interest in encouraging the understanding of Australian contemporary art in India. This interest resulted in an article published in the influential Indian arts magazine, Marg, in 1954. The invitation to write a piece on Australian contemporary art came from its editor, Mulk Raj Anand, whom Casey had worked with in 1952 on the jury for the International Prize Sculpture Exhibition focusing on the unknown political prisoner. In 
Casey obtained advice from several artists and gallery directors in Australia in the preparation of the article, but the views were clearly May's. She argued that the new vision of artists such as Drysdale and Nolan was based on the outback. This had become more accessible with the use of plane travel, a point which would have been resonated with the Indian audience. She described Drysdale's work as tremendously alive and noted that Nolan's imagination works freely and unexpectedly. Arthur Boyd, and Justin O'Brien are described as decorative artists defined by their use of color. She praised Margaret Preston for her use of indigenous design and compared her work to the Western style watercolors of Albert Namajira. Casey noted that sculpture was not a natural and anonymous form in Australia as it is in India, but discussed several modern sculptures. Given her involvement in the unknown political prisoner prize, Casey specifically mentioned two Australian sculptors who were participants, Tom Bass and Margell Hinder. The article would have been the first significant one on Australian art published in India and is idiosyncratic in its selection of artists and its description of the art styles in Australia at the time, with its focus on representation, not abstraction. Notably, she commented that those artists who were, in her words, experimenting in designs of line and colour were not sufficiently grounded in Australia to be considered in the article. May was never a supporter of abstract art. The article is not focused on style either. There is no references to modern European forms such as cubism or surrealism. The focus is on the landscape as the identifying attribute of Australian contemporary art. With the work of Drysdale and Nolan on the cusp of recognition in the United Kingdom at this time. This article is one of the first to articulate a post-war Australian art to an international audience. And it's not coincidental that these two artists, Nolan and Drysdale, were favourites of Casey and she did much to support their success. The Casey's returned to India on a regular basis from the 1950s onwards. They both continued to have fond memories of their life there. Richard is quoted as saying, I think my time in Bengal was probably the most interesting and useful. May continued her interest in India and continued to correspond with Jamini Roy until his death in 1972. She continued to assist Australian artists to promote their interest in the subcontinent. In the late 1970s, she encouraged Emily Hope to produce a book, The Queen of the Nagas, which is written and illustrated by Hope and is a feminist work focusing on the ancient matriarchal system before the rule of men. May wrote the foreword in which she recalled her time in Bengal when she listened to stories of the ancient matriarchal societies of India uh, from her interlocutors in This talk has focused on May Casey's connection with India, which should be remembered. She was a very, she was a restless person, always pursuing new ideas and environments with gusto. She made the most of her opportunities wherever she lived. She was interested in modern art and the naive which he encountered in Indian modernism, especially in the art of Jemini Roy. Her patronage of Roy helped to build his international reputation. Casey would have been proud of that connection. Her interest in India continued for the rest of her life. I hope that this talk will bring out other memories of May Casey in India, which will continue to enrich the personal narratives of connections between Australia and India. Behold India indeed. Thank you very much.
Sorry, Charles, you seem to be muted. Thank you. My apologies. We'll be finishing before four, but we've got time for questions uh, before then. But first of all, thank you, Michael. That was absolutely fascinating. The details are provocative and exciting and interesting, and that's a, a, a view onto something. I simply, it's adding to a picture. I did not have those, those details in my head, and I doubt that anybody else did either. Now we're going to uh, have time for questions, but I've got a couple of questions for you first. And the first one is an obvious one, and that is we know how terrible the famine was um, that Richard Casey and May Casey were walking into at the arrival and their arrival. We know how political that was. We know how in retrospect, Indian historians and politicians blame the British for the terrible travails of that. And yet May managed on the surface of it, according to your, your account, to have quite close sympathetic links with Indian artists. And yet those same Indian artists were almost to a person fierce nationalists. They were intensely involved with that, that movement, as were most Indians, and Bengal especially, and Calcutta especially, was an intensely politically conscious place. How is it that she negotiated those apparently amicable links with people who were bitterly opposed to the British and their presence there? How did she manage that? and less of lesser importance today, but I, I guess that many people would ask the question, how, what were Richard Casey's relationships? Like you've, you've talked about his relative, in relative terms, his sympathetic relationship with Gandhi, but, but these artists, they were fierce nationalists. Can you talk a little bit about that to us? Yeah, thanks, Charles. It, it, uh... It's a good question, and it's uh, it's interesting. It's, uh, it says a lot about, I think, the character of of May Casey. In fact, really, the character of both the Caseys. Um, when when Richard Casey was um, uh, sent to to Bengal as governor, uh, there was um, a lot of concern that he that he was Australian. Um, that was uh, in some quarters seen as as uh, not the appropriate person to, to be sending to be governor at that time. But on the other hand, I think if you look at the, the history, it was probably a very wise choice um, because uh, while he was in obviously the, uh, uh, the, the major political position of, uh, of uh, the, um, um, the colonial rulers, um, he could step away from that position of, of being uh, totally um, uh, seen as uh, as part of the Raj, he had many uh, conversations with Wavell, who was uh, who was the um, the Governor General in Delhi, and uh, and in many ways tried to support or give um, assistance to uh, the Nationalist leaders. These meetings he had in 1945 were an attempt to try and uh, find a common ground between. Um, people as, as different as Jinnah and, and Nehru and, and Gandhi. And uh, uh, he seemed to get a very good rapport with, with Gandhi. Uh, the, I think May had a, she was a great networker and I think she had a great uh, uh, rapport with people that she met, particularly uh, in the villages. And she spent a lot of time traveling around uh, uh, parts of Bengal and and this helped her to, uh, I think, to build that empathy and those bridges between particularly a lot of um, women in, in, uh, in Kolkata society. Uh, these uh, three exhibitions that we, she put on, and she was the first, um, uh, I guess, diplomatic spouse to do these, uh, were, uh, were an attempt to, uh, to build those bridges. And she certainly, given her background as, uh, with her in contemporary art, uh, and her, I would have thought, enthusiasm, if you think of uh, the, the relationship we had with, say, Germany Roy, uh, 
um, would have helped to bridge those those um, uh, those areas of uh, of interest. But it was a it was a difficult time for both of them, uh, and uh, that's what I think is even more remarkable that that May was be able to do what, what she did in in you know two years. Because the British, I mean, I, I've got a, a question similar related to mine from my friend and colleague Chaitanya Sambrani from ANU, which asks, as I did, do we know anything? But I'd like to home in on that before we get to the next question. Do we know anything about May Casey's attitude to the independence movement? Because we know that the independence movement saw that the British bore great responsibility both for the famine and for the oppression, rape and pillage of, of the Indian subcontinent over a long period of time. I mean, we're, in Australia, we, we tend to perhaps have a certain obliviousness to that, that absolute abiding anger uh, of Indians against British rule. Uh, and to some extent that sublimated by the competition between Muslim and Hindus culminating in the petition, which allows us to perhaps forget that, that absolute anger at the British. So what was her attitude to your knowledge, to the independence movement itself? Yes, May was very diplomatic in her, in her autobiography. Um, she really doesn't go into that in any, any detail and I haven't, I haven't been able to find um, much information in her letters either. She, she, uh, she was would have been sympathetic. Certainly, Richard Casey was. Um, but as I said, she she was very diplomatic, and and in some ways, when you when you read her autobiography, um, you might um, you might be uh, uh, thought that. A lot of these things didn't happen. She mm. talks about her her living in the in government house. She talks about travelling around. She talks about going to the villages, um, but it, it's only in a few areas, in a few sections, when she particularly talks about her meetings and Richard's meetings with the uh, nationalist leaders that that um, concern comes through. But yeah. certainly, um, uh, when she arrived and when when the, she and Richard arrived in 1944. It was a very difficult time, and certainly Richard had um, quite a difficult time with the uh, with the government of, uh, of of Bengal at that period, and that's why he had to uh, invoke right. a governor's rule. Mm. Mm. My um, friend and colleague again, uh, John Clark from Sydney University, asks a question, and it's a really great question to see if we can tease that out. Uh, did May Casey know Peter Townsend? who found it out monthly and was in the 60s and 70s, the uh, editor of the most important art magazine in, in England and probably Europe, Studio International, when Peter Townsend was in Calcutta during the war and he spoke often with Germini Roy, would it have been likely that they knew each other or have you come across Peter Townsend's name? Peter Townsend incidentally retired to Australia, became late in his life the editor of Art Monthly Australia and then retired here. What, what do you know about Townsend? Does he come up in your research, Michael? Uh, yes, I have heard of him and it relates uh, to, um, uh, to the introduction of, of Germany Roy to, to the United Kingdom. And that right. was done in 1945. There was an exhibition put on by, uh, in, in London of Germany Roy's work. Uh, and in fact, May Casey um, uh, lent some of her uh, her paintings to that uh, to that exhibition, uh, but uh, that's all I really know. Um, there was uh, another um, uh, well-known um, uh, scholar of Indian art, uh, John Irwin, who was uh, worked with uh, in Government House at the time when uh, when May Casey was there, who uh, was involved, I think, in that exhibition in London. And of course, he became, uh, went on to become a, a well-known scholar in Indian art. Uh, but I, I've heard Townsend's name, but I don't know too much about his involvement. Mm. You, um, you say that um, May and Richard Casey were um, perhaps Australia, 
having an Australian as, go as governor was unusual That's a, and uh, perhaps helped them. By that, do you mean that they were perceived, Australia was perceived as a post as a colonial subject of Britain as well? Were they perhaps slightly immune or insulated from the hatred of the British because of their Australianness? Yes, I think I think that's right. There is there's often um, a, a connection between Australians and Indians in that very in that very area that uh, that. You know, we we were also uh, um, colonial subjects up until 1900, and and there is a uh, at times, and it was with certain people in India, even to today, there's a sympathy between that relation, that post-colonial idea of uh, of where Australia sits and where India sits. Um, but again, for for some people, it's uh, uh, you know Australians are still seen in the same mould as as uh, as the Raj, but I think Casey was able to uh, to build um, those relationships because I think he did step back from being um, uh, as uh, as a represent well being representative of 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 you know uh, of UK and uh, and uh, of the Raj. He was able to bring that Australian experience to uh, to his job, which I I think did help him uh, to build those bridges. And as I said, when he left, um, he left uh, with um, uh, quite a bit of uh, support from, from both sides and all sides of politics. That's interesting. They were coming, remind me my, of this, they were coming from, from a tenure, from a period in, in America, weren't they? Washington. They came, uh, uh, they were in the United States from 1940 to 1942. And then from 1942 to 1944, um, he was uh, in Cairo as a special representative for uh, uh, for uh, Winston Churchill in, in Cairo. For the so, we, but we, so we know that um, May Casey knew, were, knew the New York art scene, that we know that she was aware of American art of that period. Is there any sign of, of American artists or, or people involved with, with American art in Delhi at that time? Sorry, in Calcutta at that time? No, Did look, I haven't. America I haven't come no, into I, that? You know, it's, it's, uh, it's still very British and very European oriented. Although, mm -hmm. you know, there were, um, there were uh, obviously um, American uh, servicemen in, in Calcutta, servicemen and women. And in fact, one of uh, uh, one of the aides to uh, in Government House was uh, was an American uh, service woman. So, so she wasn't projecting Australian art into India at that point, or 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 America, the American art that she'd become very aware of in her connection with the very young museum of modern art. It was Australia. It, she was obviously concerned with absorbing and understanding and collecting Indian art, correct? That's correct. Yes, that's right. And uh, and certainly her... Uh, um, as mentioned with Cecil Beaton and his, his Indian works, um, which again was uh, part of uh, um, the, the information war that the, the United Kingdom was uh, mm. uh, were using photographers to do. So, um, yes, he... Um, What's interesting, I think, is when she left India and and, uh, and her article on on Australian art yeah. for an Indian audience is quite fascinating because this was five or six years after she'd been in uh, in in Kolkata, and she really is talking there about about the relationship of of Australian art to uh, to an Indian audience. Mm. Mm. I welcome any other questions that our um, guests our audience has uh, before we finish. But, um, but, and as I wait for any other questions, I, I want to ask you, who was the governor in New Delhi at this point? And was, was, were they involved in any comparable way in, um, in, any connect, in making connections with Indian artists? Or is this very unusual? Because it can't be accidental or incidental that May Casey did this. I think it must have been perceived 
very definitely as quite intentional and significant by uh, Indian people, by people in Calcutta. Yes, the the um, the Governor General in, in New Delhi was General Wavell mm -hmm. uh, at this time. And uh, it's interesting in the um, a couple of little anecdotes. The 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 governor's spouse really had not much to do in uh, uh, up to, up until the time that that May uh, um, May and, and Richard went to Kolkata. But there, there had been um, at that time a, a comment made. I think that they would like to have seen the spouses do more. Uh, and anyone who's been in the in the diplomatic service will have heard this one before. Uh, and so she she was there under in a way um, given her her uh, her style to be able to uh, uh, build these bridges. So yes, there, there was it was a bit of a, a concerted effort to do that. And um, the uh, the Casey's had to go to uh, to New Delhi for uh, for meetings with uh, with the Governor General and the other governors. And um, um, it was the first time I think when when May was there that the the actual spouses of the of the governors got together to talk about uh, their role and what they can do to support um, the uh, their um, I guess uh, their um, uh, the presence of the of uh, the governors in uh, in their particular provinces. Did um, May Casey show any interest in Egyptian? Um, this is a question from our audience, from Sandra. Did May Casey show any interest in Egyptian art when she was in Egypt? Do you, would you know that? And, yes. and if not, what do you think it was about Indian art that drew her in? Yeah, she 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 was she was very much did what she did in uh, in Kolkata. She did in Cairo, right. but very much involved in the in the art scene there. And yes, had some very close friends uh, who were in the uh, art movements there. And uh, I talk a little bit about this in in my thesis as well. But there was a uh, a very uh, well known uh, Egyptian artist named Amy Nima or Amy Smart who was uh, uh, part of the uh, e Egyptian surrealist group. And uh, she and, and May were, were very close friends and, and May did collect her work as well. Where are those works now? No yes, um, some of the works uh, I think are still in the family. Uh, a number of them were sold when they um, uh, passed away in 1983. Uh, other works were sold um, over the last 20 years, but it's, um, and of course, some of the works were given to uh, to institutions such as the Jemini Roy uh, works that we uh, I talked about today, to, which were given to the National Gallery of Victoria. That's right, uh, yeah. and which I'm not aware of them being on display. And um, I'll ask the curators about them. So yeah. thank you for that. They have been on display in the last uh, year or so, but there's Ooh. also uh, um, uh, there's about twelve. Many Roy uh, works, I think, in the in the National Gallery of Victoria. Oh, fantastic. I'm going to call our marvelous seminar to a close in a second. Um, a comment, though, uh, from our audience. A comment. It seems to me that the work of Bengal modernists that May Casey took to the other colonies, such as Australia, were of exotic subject matter. Nandala Bose did some amazing work on the famine itself. From memory, I've seen those drawings in major contemporary art exhibitions in Europe more recently, but they didn't seem to draw her interest, perhaps. So, in other words, um, does Nandala Bose come up in the literature? Uh, yes, or no, I mean, certainly with part of the Bengal group in, uh, in, the, uh, in the early. But with May? But no, 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 oh. May. Uh, um, uh, her the 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 works that I've been able to find that were in her collection I mentioned uh, in in the talk and there, there weren't all that many um, uh, but uh, um, the the earliest work was by Chakravarti um, that I've been aware of but no not, as far as I know she um, her interest really was she had an interest in in naive and in, in non-Western representation so I think that's why she would have liked. Uh, Shergill and um, uh, and Roy 
that mm. was her interest. And if you look at her uh, her art collection, there's a, a, quite a lot of work uh, from that in that style that she collected. So I'm going to now draw us to a close. And could you all thank Michael very much, as I do, for opening our eyes to an area of art history that I simply was unaware of this connection. Thank you, Michael. I'm very grateful. Thank you very much, Charles. Thank you. It's, my, it's a privilege. Thank you, everybody.